She has gone down in history as the lucky fourth wife of Henry VIII. But as we've discovered in the first two parts of this series, Anne of Cleves was anything but lucky. She was patient, intelligent, and kind. She was human like you and me. Unlike her predecessors, Anne was able to maneuver through a failed marriage to become the longest surviving of all of Henry's wives. Hello, and welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. My name is Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com, and today we are concluding our series on one of your favorite Tudor queens, Anne of Cleves. As usual, before I begin, I must thank those who have helped to get me where I am today. First and foremost, my Patreon subscribers. Without your donations, I would not be able to give you this podcast. All the donations that are received go right back into the show. The costs involved in running my website and research material to ensure you get proper facts. If you feel you'd like to make a donation as well, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click become a patron. You can choose the monthly level that fits your budget. For as little as a dollar per month, you can join my inner circle of friends. Thank you to those of you who have been with me from the beginning. Welcome back to those who have come in some time after. And for those of you who are new to this podcast, welcome. Now, sit back, turn up the volume, close your eyes, and let's transport back in time to the life of Anne of Cleves. At the end of my last podcast, Anne of Cleves Part 2, It was the 9th of July, 1540, and the marriage between King Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves was declared null and void, and Anne would, going forward, be called the King's sister. I'm going to quote author Elizabeth Norton again because she says it so well. Quote, Despite her acquiescence, Anne always believed herself to be the legitimate wife of the king and the true queen. In spite of this, she was first and foremost a survivor, and... If the price of that survival was denial of her true status in exchange for a life of opulent retirement, she was prepared to play along, even if that meant accepting a new lower status, beside her former maid, Queen Catherine Howard. The 28th of July was a very important date in Tudor history for two reasons. First of all, Thomas Cromwell was executed. And secondly, Henry VIII married his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, privately at Oatlands Palace. Even after all the name-calling and anger toward the marriage to Anne, Henry was still sensitive to his ex-wife's feelings. A few days after his fifth wedding, Henry traveled from Hampton Court Palace to Richmond Palace to dine with Anne. This is the part where I wonder, where was Henry's head? He was obsessed with Catherine Howard, we all know that. So what would have caused him to leave his new wife to dine with the old wife he was so turned off by? Had he already realized that his young bride lacked the maturity of a good conversation? Or maybe it was just respect he had for a woman who gave him exactly what he wanted. Anne enjoyed her newfound independence and stayed at Richmond Palace through the end of the year. It became her favorite location, one that she later made her primary home. When their marriage was dissolved, Henry told Anne that she could visit court whenever she pleased, but this was not the case. For a while, her visits were limited to give Catherine Howard the time she deserved to flourish as queen, until she was invited to celebrate the new year at court. Anne arrived at Hampton Court Palace on the 3rd of January. Anne's first meeting with the new queen was a nervous one, but Catherine seems to have been even more nervous about her meeting with her husband's ex-wife. Prior to the meeting, Catherine asked those around her for advice on how to properly welcome her husband's former wife. She wanted to make sure it was all done perfectly. When Catherine entered the room, Anne fell to her knees and greeted the new queen with all the reverence she deserved. Catherine was thrown off by Anne's behavior and begged her to stand. Anne refused and continued to kneel in front of Catherine, insisting on showing the new queen that she was respected by the king's sister. While all this was going on, Henry entered the room to witness the interaction. He acknowledged and bowed to Anne, and then the three of them had dinner together. When dinner finished, Henry, Catherine, and Anne spent a short amount of time together before the king retreated to his apartments. Anne and Catherine spent the rest of the night talking and dancing like two friends. They got along quite well. 
when her time at court was over, Anne returned to Richmond Palace, satisfied with how it all went. The Queen and Anne had got along well, and the King was kind and gracious to Anne. Things were definitely looking up for the King's sister. In August 1540, the French ambassador, Merilec, wrote that Anne was, quote, far from pretending to be married. She is as joyous as ever and wears new dresses every day, end quote. Even the ambassador for Cleves was surprised at Anne's behavior, curious why she was acting so merry. This was Anne's coping mechanism after the humiliation of her failed marriage and stint as Queen of England. By October of the same year, there were rumors circulating that King Henry would discard Catherine and take Anne back. While Anne would have welcomed the reunion with Henry, she knew that Catherine was his little rose without a thorn and that the king was very happy with his young bride. Apparently, even Catherine Howard caught wind of these rumors because Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, wrote that the queen had been very sad, and when Henry asked her why, she said that she feared she would be put aside for Anne of Cleves. The king quickly told her that the rumors were rubbish, and that if he were to marry again, it would not be Anne of Cleves. Not very reassuring, if you ask me. Catherine should have felt a little more confident in March of 1541 when Henry brought her to London in all the glory that Anne of Cleves had not been given. Both Henry and Catherine traveled in the same barge down the Thames, this time, unlike the 4th of February 1540 when the king and queen traveled in separate barges. With all that being said, Henry VIII still kept Anne of Cleves in his thoughts. He acted as a protective older brother to her, or maybe a controlling ex-husband, you be the judge. This behavior was evident when Francis of Lorraine married Christina of Denmark in 1541. Henry proclaimed that their marriage was not lawful because, as he had claimed, Anne was the real legitimate wife of Lorraine. That fall, when the scandal broke about Catherine Howard's past in the household of the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, Henry was heartbroken by the news and things only got worse for Catherine on that front. Around the same time, rumors began to stir that Anne of Cleves had had a child by the king, which was conceived during her visit on New Year's. This was the time that she had met Catherine Howard for the first time. King Henry knew himself that he was not the father, and so he demanded a full investigation into the matter. Henry's counsel sent for a couple of Anne's attendants to get to the bottom of the matter, and after questioning Lady Wingfield and Lady Ratsay, they were able to determine that there was no truth in the matter. Anne of Cleves was very upset about the whole affair, but her attitude soon changed when she heard about the downfall of Catherine Howard. While Anne had been very friendly with Catherine upon their meeting, she was joyous to find out that the queen was in disgrace. To her, this meant that there was still hope for her to be reinstated as queen. The Duke of Cleves even tried to convince the king that he should marry Anne once again, but Henry would not hear any of it because he was still nursing a wounded heart over the Catherine Howard affair and would never have considered remarrying Anne. Even after Catherine Howard's execution, Anne thought she had a chance to be reinstated, but once again, she was disappointed by the lack of interest on the king's part. After a year without a queen, Henry VIII married Catherine Parr in July of 1543. Anne of Cleves didn't find out about the wedding until two weeks after when the king asked to dine with her again at Richmond Palace, just as he had after he married Catherine Howard. This time, Anne was devastated. She couldn't understand why Henry would marry another woman, especially one that was less attractive than she was. At least with Catherine Howard, she could believe that the king's obsession with her maid is what ended their marriage. But with Parr, she was left confused and hurt. Anne was so hurt by the king's marriage that she wanted to leave England, but she would soon find out that she would not be able to return home because of conflict between her brother and the emperor. After much conflict, loss of land, and the death of her mother, Anne understood that the cleave she knew no longer existed. In 1546, Anne was able to put her dislike for Catherine Parr behind her and became a regular visitor at court. During Anne's frequent visits to court, the king was so kind to her that rumors began to spread once again about the two having an affair, and this time it was said that she had two children by the king. These rumors once again had no base. In the final months of the king's life, Anne of Cleves truly felt like she was part of the royal family, spending much time with Henry, the queen, and the king's children. 
When Henry VIII died in 1547, Anne was saddened by the loss of a man she truly respected. She had never loved him, but had become very fond of him. Upon the king's death, she was no longer the king's sister. Now she was just the king's aunt. Anne soon realized that her new role at Tudor court was one of expensive irrelevance, or at least that's how the new king's council saw her. They, of course, couldn't see why Henry VIII's promises to his ex-wife had to be upheld by the reign of his son. From the time of her divorce from Henry VIII in 1540 up until his death in 1547, Anne's divorce settlement was most generous, not to mention when Anne needed financial assistance, the king would step up and help. Unfortunately, after Henry's death, the state of England began to change when inflation set in and Anne's settlement wasn't nearly enough to cover all of her expenses. Where the old king once had helped his ex-wife, the new king's council wasn't so generous. The payments that had once been promised to Anne by King Henry VIII soon fell into arrears, and by 1550, things were growing so desperate for Anne that she petitioned King Edward. At first, her payments were delayed due to the king being in progress, but once he returned, she received some, but not all, of what was owed to her. Once again in 1552, she complained and had lands and manors granted to her. The rent from these were not nearly enough to sustain Anne's household payments and were merely meant to supplement her income. During the remainder of King Edward's reign, Anne's property was continually under attack to be taken from her and her income dwindled mightily. Anne continued to wish during this time that she could return home to Cleves, but could also retain her income, both of which would not be granted. After the death of Edward VI, Anne would have been witness to the tragic events that followed regarding Lady Jane Grey. Anne had always been friends with the Lady Mary and supported her cause when Jane Grey was thrust into the throne of England by her father-in-law. During Queen Mary's coronation procession, Anne was front and center in the first chariot following the Queen. She was, after all, a very prestigious member of the Tudor court and shared the chariot with Lady Elizabeth, the heir to the throne. At the coronation banquet, Anne also sat at the same table as the Queen and Lady Elizabeth. This event would be Anne's final public appearance. When Queen Mary began to consider prospects for a husband, Anne voiced her opinion in the matter. At this time, there were several men being considered. Edward Courtney, Earl of Devon, Don Louis of Portugal, Prince Philip of Spain, Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, the King of Denmark, the Prince of Piedmont, and even her cousin Reginald Pole. Anne favored Ferdinand of Austria because a marriage with him would ensure good relations with Cleves, since there was a relation to her family through marriage. By November of 1553, Mary had decided who she would marry. At this point, I'm confident that she always knew it was Philip of Spain. Her connection to her mother's Spanish roots were so strong, and she knew this would bring her the glory that her mother would have been proud of. Anne, like many others, was disappointed by Mary's selection. Her counsel and her subjects, well, most anyway, were equally displeased. During Wyatt's rebellion, Mary believed both Anne of Cleves and the Lady Elizabeth were involved. It appears that Mary had the paranoia of both her father and grandfather, as there is no evidence that either woman was involved. But, to be honest, after the ascension of Lady Jane Grey, why wouldn't she have been suspicious? Anne did not attend the wedding of Mary to Philip of Spain, for whatever reason, but she did write her a letter of congratulations. She ended it by saying, quote, "...wishing you both much joy and felicity with increase of children to God's glory, and to the preservation of your prosperous estates, long to continue with honor and all godly virtue." End quote. There is no evidence that Anne returned to Mary's court. Her rise to favor under the reign of Mary ended nearly as soon as it began. She spent her remaining years in quiet obscurity. Life was never easy for Anne after the death of Henry VIII. The money that had been promised was not delivered as it should have been, and she struggled to run her household and pay her servants. She was never looked after again, like when she was the king's sister. By the end of April 1557, Anne was very sick. She had been sick for quite some time. That spring, she moved to Chelsea Manor, where her health increasingly declined. On the 12th of July, Anne realized she was dying. Three days later, while holding the hand of her ladies, Anne of Cleves died. She was 41 years old and the last wife of Henry VIII to join him in the afterlife. 
In my journey to discover the real Anne of Cleves, I have learned more about her than I had ever known before. She wasn't just the lucky wife, she was so much more. Thank you so much for joining me for my Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Until next week.